Well, welcome. Um, my name's Bill Busby, and I'm here with Ben Chang. We're members of a Google's Android team and are going to talk to you today about the new JIT compiler that was announced this morning. Now, uh, whoops, wrong direction here. So uh, we've got a live Google Wave going on in this session. So if you'd uh, have a browser handy, hop on over to bit.ly slash blzjnf. Sure. Because we need for the closed caption to come back to I jumped that on it. Okay. Okay, um, so the way this is going to work today, we're going to break this talk into two parts. Uh, in the beginning, I'm going to talk a bit about JIT compilers in general, why in particular we chose this style of JIT compiler for portable Android devices, uh, what kind of performance you can expect to see out of the JIT, and then where we, where we expect to take this JIT in the future. And then we're going to shift gears a little bit. And as you know, uh, this is an open source project, so all the source code for the JIT is going to be part of the Android open source release. And with that source code, you will be able to actually build some special instrumented uh, and profiling versions of the JIT to enable you to do some more interesting things about seeing how the JIT interacts with your application. And Ben's going to talk more about that. He'll dig into some performance case studies, um, show you how to profile with the JIT, and then talk to you about one of the features that I think is particularly cool with the JIT, something that a normal user wouldn't use, but as developers you might be interested in, and that's the self-verification mode that the JIT has itself. Now, if you're going to write a program for Android, you're most likely going to write it in the Java programming language and then push the source code through the SDK. And what pops out at the end is an executable targeted to the Dalvik virtual machine. Now, uh, as, as they mentioned this morning in the, uh, the keynote, one of the great things about targeting a virtual machine is that you can just simply move an implementation of that virtual machine to different physical devices with different underlying processors, different hardware capabilities, but the application should still run. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what Dalvik is, the, our particular virtual machine, but I will point you to a talk that was done in Google I.O. two years ago. Uh, follow this link, and Dan Bornstein gave a great talk about Dalvik, why we chose it, and what are the features. But I do want to bring out a couple of key features of Dalvik that are important in this context. Number one, Dalvik is an extremely compact representation for an executable. And that was so important for us with a, with a mobile device with limited resources. Um, second, uh, it, it accomplished that largely through an emphasis on sharing code and data. And then uh, finally, uh, the Dalvik environment is, has a security sandbox system where, I mean, process sandbox security system that enables you to, uh, to make sure that information doesn't bleed from one process to another when you don't want it to. And that becomes important when we're thinking about JITs. Now, at the center of every Dalvik virtual machine implementation is an instruction at a time interpreter. Now, interpreters, the way they work, um, the, they will go out and fetch one Dalvik instruction at a time. We call them Dalvik bytecodes. Pull the instruction apart, see what it is. That's called the decode phase. And then go ahead and interpret it or execute it. And that execution is done by using actually the host instructions on the host processor. But what you have in effect there with interpretation is an extra stage of execution. So you have to pull up the bytecode, figure out what it is, then use host instructions to carry it out, and the CPU will pick up the host instructions and, and, and execute them. And that extra level of, of, of evaluation is what gives interpreters a bit of a bad name for being slow. I mean, there's some great reasons why you would want to use an interpreter, but the downside is that they're often a bit slower than native, natively uh, compiled code. Now, we didn't think that, um, we think that sometimes this interpretation gets more of a bad rap than it, than it really should in an Android system, and there's several reasons for that. First of all, our interpreter is really, really fast. It's a very well done interpreter. We had one of our partners uh, benchmark our Dalvik interpreter against a traditional Java, um, Java interpreter, and they told us that the Dalvik interpreter was roughly twice as fast, which we were happy to hear. But the other and perhaps more important reason 
is that not everything, when your application is running on an Android system, it's not really in interpretation the whole time. The system itself has already been natively compiled and optimized. All the, uh, a lot of the libraries, the really key libraries, graphics and other things that you need to run fast are done in native code already. So it's really just a, sometimes a smallish amount of code that's actually being interpreted when your program runs. Uh, ben recently uh, did a little bit of a study with his phone running over the weekend and found that in typical use, less than a third of the total execution time was actually spent interpreted. Most of the time was spent running code that was already natively compiled and optimized. And the upshot of that is, is that for most applications, the interpreter performance is just fine. And in fact, it's really a benefit there because an interpreted environment typically requires less memory, a smaller memory footprint than a natively compiled one. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in general, but just the, the high order bit here is that the Dalvik bytecodes are very, they're very expressive for their size. So if you translate a Dalvik bytecode into, say, underlying ARM instructions, you'll get a significant code expansion. So keeping it Dalvik is actually a good idea. But this good enough for most applications doesn't mean it's perfect. For some applications, you really, really do feel the pain of interpretation, applications in which you do a lot of computation. And, and that, that gets painful because you, you experience the slowdown of the interpreter, which is often on the order of five to 10 times. Now, we've had two strategies in play, or two strategies planned to deal with this slowdown that computation intensive programs would face. The first of those, the result we came out last year with the release of the Android NDK, or Native Development Kit. This was a software development kit that makes it easy, easier to isolate the compute intensive portions of your program, rewrite those in a natively compiled language, and then call them from your, your Android application. The other part of the solution is what we're announced, we've already announced today, and that's the just-in-time compiler. A just-in-time compiler still has an interpreter involved, the interpreter will interpret your program until it identifies what's the most compute intensive part of it, what's the really hot chunks of your program, and then it will pull those out, compile them and optimize them into native code so that the next time you invoke that section of code, you're not doing interpretation anymore, you're just doing direct execution of the native code. Now, putting a JIT on Android has been something we've talked about for a long time internally, but the big question was, what kind of a JIT can we fit into an Android system? As it turns out, the JIT design space is pretty large. Um, I mean, with the popularity of Java, most people now are familiar with JITs, uh, and, and generally a particular style of JIT, but it's actually, there's quite a broad design field. The way we like to think of it is you could break it down into, break, it, break the JIT design down into two axes. Along one axis would be, what does it mean for just in time? When do you do the compilation? You could do it when you first install the application, or maybe you do it the first time a method is called, or when you page in some code off of disk. The other axis is, what is the unit of compilation? Do you compile the whole program, a whole shared library, just a physical page of code, or maybe you do a method, or a string of instructions, or even a single instructions worth of code at once. And now, looking back over the last 20 years or so with just-in-time compilers and dynamic translation systems, you could actually pretty much fill in every square of that matrix about this chunk of thing you were compiling and when it was you were doing the compilation. And it's not really the case that any one combination is best. Each combination had a, had a set of you know, characteristics that were good in some situations and bad in another. And what our trick, the, the trick for us was to find the combination that worked really well on a portable memory constrained device. So our key, our key requirements going into this process, we needed to find a JIT system that could deliver performance using a very small amount of memory. You know, you've, you've, from all the talks today, you'll hear about how important memory is on these devices, and I think you know this. So we couldn't have a JIT that wasted a lot of memory or, or took too much. The next, it had to coexist with this processor container security model. Uh, and this is, this, I won't get into this too much, but a lot of JIT styles would have information being bled between processes, and we needed to avoid that. And finally, the last two ones are something that we considered really important for this type of device. 
We wanted the performance that were going to be delivered by doing the just-in-time compilation to come to the user quickly. We didn't want somebody to have an application that they had to run to warm it up for you know, a minute, an hour, a day. We wanted them to get the boost from compilation as soon as possible. And finally, we're kind of sensitive about, uh, this is an interactive device, so we're sensitive to kind of jerky execution and pausing. We wanted the transition between interpretation and compiled, uh, compiled code to be really smooth. So I won't go through the whole matrix, excuse me. <coughs> But the question really came down to two general classes of JIT, JIT styles. The first one, uh, method-based JIT, is what you're most familiar with in, a Java, in, in the Java world. This is what you would see on a server-style JIT. It starts off with interpreting your program until it finds the methods that are most frequently executed, the hot methods. Then it'll pull out the code a method at a time in method-sized chunks, do the compilation, and then create a native version of that method in optimized host code. There's some great performance, there's some great strengths of this model, and that's one of the reasons why it's most pop is very popular today. But the biggest one is that you have a really nice optimization window. If you're doing optimizations, you have to know what's happening in the code you're optimizing. But as important, or even more important, you need to know what is not going to happen, what can't happen, so that you can make the best assumptions. You have to know that these pointers aren't going to alias. You need to know that this sub-expression is never going to be used again so I can drop it. And doing compilation in method-sized chunks uh, has that, that advantage. Secondly. In this kind of environment where you're interpreting some of the time and you're running compiled code other times, you're going to have to transition between those two domains. And transitioning at method boundaries is a nice, clean place to do it, because the interpreter and the compiled code need to know where everything lives in order to make this whole thing work together. But weaknesses, it definitely has some. But the, and the primary weakness is that even though you've identified what the hot methods are, all these hot methods are most likely going to contain some cold code, some code that really isn't going to be executed handling the exceptional cases, the odd cases. And with method at a time compilation, you're going to be spending resources, time, and space to compile and optimize code that's never really going to be run. The, um, the other downside to a method-based compilation system is that it takes a lot more memory to do the compile. And that's in part because you're, you're compiling more instructions at once. And also, the optimizations you would do, the kind of flow analysis over the, the whole method, uh, is pretty, pretty expensive in terms of what you, resources you need to do the compilation. And then finally, um, doing all this extra work means it's going to be longer before the benefit of that compilation comes to you. So the other style, the trace-based JIT, uh, this is a style that uh, a lot of people haven't heard too much about, but it was actually very really popular. It is the style of JIT that is typically used when you're doing code migrations or virtualizations of one architecture on another. Uh, this was very popular back in the 90s especially. What it does, very similar to the method-based JIT, is you start off interpreting, but and you, you interpret until you find out what the hot chunks of code are. But in this case, the chunks are not contained methods. They're actually just a run of instructions that will start someplace, you'll execute for a while, maybe you'll follow a branch or two, perhaps you'll identify a loop, and it'll pull out just those instructions, straighten them out into a straight line trace of code, then optimize that straight line trace of code. It'll take these translated chunks, then store them in a translation cache, and chain them all together so that execution will kind of bounce from one, tra tra one trace to another. And this type, of, this type of trace formation, you don't actually even need to respect uh, method call boundaries. You could even have a trace that goes through a method call. The great strength of this one is that you're only optimizing the hottest of the hot code. I mean, it really has to be the code that's, that's running before you, you, you bother to put the resources into compiling it. Another benefit that's a little bit more subtle but, but quite useful is that these, this type of, of uh, JIT system is typically more tightly integrated with the interpreter. So you're bouncing between the interpreter and the translated code um, a little bit more frequently. But what it also means is that you're never very far away from the interpreter. So in the translated code, you can arrange it, if you choose, to have it that the translated code doesn't have to deal with any exceptional cases. 
If it detects that something, some assumption it's made has gone wrong or if it sees that, oh, there's a null pointer here I have to deal with, it doesn't actually have to deal with it. It can just roll back the state, return, return to the interpreter, and let the interpreter handle all the messy nastiness associated with handling these unusual cases. And this actually turns out to be pretty powerful in allowing a, a trace compiler to be simpler and focus really on what, what's going to return the performance rather than all the details about handling every possible corner case, but of course still being correct. Um, finally, you get a really rapid return on, on, on investment. The performance comes back quickly. You're compiling little small chunks. You don't have to wait very long until you decide some chunk is hot, and you can stitch it right into the application and get the boost from that compilation right away. Now, as everything, there's downsides. The primary downside in a trace-based system is it relates to that window of optimization. You don't really have a good view of the world outside of the trace when you're optimizing that trace. You can only optimize within it. You don't really know what's happening once you leave the trace, and so you have to make kind of worst case assumptions with some optimizations, and that limits you somewhat. And also, if there's um, as I mentioned, you're popping back and forth more frequently with the interpreted mode versus translated. So if there's a cost, an extra cost associated with making that transition, you're going to pay it more frequently. And then finally, these fragments of code are pr pretty much always continually changing. And it becomes very difficult to share changing fragments of code across processes. It's actually kind of difficult to share them even within a process among threads, but we can do that. But across processes would be tough. OK, so lots of words, so let me throw a picture up here and get back to this notion of what is hot. Now, Ben took a look at one of the key, app, the key processes on a running Android system, and that's the system server process. It's a process that provides uh, services to running applications, and the bytecode involved in that was about four and a half megabytes. Now, profiling this over 20 minutes, as if we were a method at a time JIT, found that roughly 8% of that four and a half megabytes of code was actually worth compiling. Uh, the rest of it either wasn't executed or wasn't executed enough to bother to uh, try to speed it up. But then looking at it just in terms of hot traces, it all goes all the way down to 2%. So really only 2% of that, for us, large process mattered enough that it needed to be optimized. And this is, this is kind of the, the benefit of a trace compiler. If we look at just the higher high bit of the decision point, it was the method JIT could provide the best optimization possibilities, but the trace JIT really does provide the best return on investment, the best return for the memory and processor spent in order to do the translation. So that's what we decided to go with. The Dalvik JIT in Froyo is a trace-based JIT, but and, and again, the, the key factors for us making this decision was to minimize the memory use and then also to get that performance coming back to the user as quickly as possible. One thing we worried about is if, if we had gone with another model is the, the, the usage case of a user downloading an application from the market and then discarding it before it had been running long enough to trigger the hot code detection and the recompilation to give the performance that you needed. With a trace JIT, the performance comes to you just almost immediately. Now, we also realized, too, that although we, we, we kind of obsess over battery-powered Android devices, a lot of the times they're not really battery-powered, and they don't really need to be that responsive, and that's when they're plugged in and charging. When one of these phones is charging, it actually starts looking a lot like a server, a lot like the kind of environment in which a method-based JIT is most appropriate. So although we're not doing it now, we're leaving the door open, leaving the path open that in the future, we could perhaps bring in the best of both worlds, have the trace JIT available to give the immediate speed boost for a running application when you're on battery powered. And then when you're charging, when the phone's not being used, perhaps a more advanced uh, method-based JIT could come along and do some extra optimization. But that's, that's just a possible path forward. OK, so time for a flowchart. Um, let's just walk through very quickly kind of a simplified version of how the trace JIT works. So what I mentioned a trace is a string of instructions, kind of a straight-line string of instructions, and that has to have a start. 
We call the, the, the potential start of any trace to be the trace head. That's you know, the point in the code that the trace can begin from. Let's say we're in the interpreter, and let's say we're at one of these trace head points. Now, that's generally the target of a backward branch, the entry point to a method, the uh, target of an indirect branch. There are several possibilities. The interpreter will say, hey, I'm at, I'm at a potential trace head, and so it will increment a profile counter associated with that potential head. Then it will ask itself, have I been here enough that this thing matters? Uh, in the beginning, the answer will be no. So the interpreter will go back to interpreting as fast as it can until it comes to the next potential trace head. It'll update its, its profile counter, ask the question again, have I reached my threshold? Is this something that's interesting? And eventually, the answer will come back, yes, this is interesting. I've been here enough. This, this is something I want to take a look at. The next question is asked, do I already have a translation for this address? And if I do, then we'll just send execution directly to that translation so we can start translating natively. But again, let's say we're in the beginning of the world. The answer would be no. So we don't have a translation for that address, so we want to build one. So we go, into, we go back to the interpreter. So we're going to continue interpreting, but we're going to continue interpreting in a special mode. We call this trace building mode. We essentially single step the interpreter. And every time we successfully interpret an instruction, we'll add that instruction to the list of instructions for that trace that we want to have translated. Now, how, how long we keep doing that and when we stop, that's one of the tuning parameters we have in the JIT. Basically, you know, how, how many branches do you follow before your trace is terminated? At some point, we'll decide, OK, this is long enough. We want to terminate this trace. And then we'll send the request off to the compiler thread. Meanwhile, the interpreter goes back to interpreting, so you can continue making forward progress. Now, at some point, the compiler thread will get around to compiling that trace into a sequence of native instructions, and it will install it into the translation cache. Now, one of the, uh, something that to keep in mind, when we first put a translation in the translation cache, it's going to have some, I mean, all traces are going to have branches that exit the trace. When we first put it in the translation cache, those branches that exit the trace are going to be hardwired to send us back to the interpreter. So if the very first time we jump in, we do the translation, then we'd get back to the interpreter and go look for new, new hot traces to compile. But on the way out, once we've completed that trace and we're going back to the interpreter, the question will be asked, is there a translation for where I'm going? And if the answer is yes, then we'll replace that exit branch with a direct trace to trace branch. The upshot of this is that in practice, very quickly, we spend very little time in the interpreter. We'll, we'll collect all of our hot traces, chain them all together, and so we're really just bouncing from trace to trace to trace to trace in the translation cache with an occasional bounce out to the interpreter to find some other hot trace before we come back in to the translation cache. It, it works remarkably well. OK, so that's kind of what I've already said. Now, what I described was really the flow for almost any, any trace-based JIT. It's, it's the basic flow model. Some specifics about the Dalvik JIT. We have a, per, a translation cache per process. So every Dalvik process is going to have its own private translation cache. But all the threads within that process will share that cache. Um, we have some uh, simple traces right now. Uh, this is kind of release 1.0, so we're being conservative. Our traces are not very long. We'll generally just be one or two basic blocks, and a basic block in compiler terms is a string of instructions followed by a branch out. Our optimizations are pretty straightforward. For local optimizations, we do register promotion, load store elimination. If we can reduce, if we can eliminate null checks, we do so. And then we do some instruction scheduling just on, based on some heuristics. We've also got some nice loop detection code in there. So if we can detect a loop, we can do some more, uh, more some, some of the simple loop optimizations, invariant code motion, and uh, play around a bit with the induction variables. OK, so now this is really the slide that everybody cares about. How well did it work? Um, it worked out really pretty well. This top chart here, it's, uh, the scale on the left shows you how many times faster the jitted code is than the interpreted code, the jitted code in Froyo is, than the interpreted code that you would see in the Eclair release. And we're seeing anywhere from two to five times a performance boost, excuse me, 
on, on, on these kind of applications. Now, again, this is, just want to be clear, this is the performance boost of the interpreted code. So if you have an application that's already spending most of its time in a native code library, the JIT's not going to do much for you because you're not really doing any interpretation to start with. This is an improvement relative to the amount of interpretation that happens in the program. But we're still pretty happy with it. Now, the bottom chart, though, I'll have to say, is actually the one that I'm personally happiest with. And this is an indication of how much memory we consume in order to get this performance boost. Um, if you look at that first one, Linpack, that scale on the left is actually in kilobytes. So we're not measuring memory usage in megabytes or gigabytes, but actually we're, getting, we're only consuming about 100 or so kilobytes of total heap. This is heap for the profiling system, for the JIT compiler itself, and the memory used by the translations uh, that, that are produced by it. And this is really a very, very small number relative to, uh, to, to traditional JITs. So we're extremely happy about, again, the return on investment, the performance we've been able to achieve with the very small amount of memory that we're using. So what's next? Um, this is our first release. We've got some nice plans going forward. The, Two key optimizations that we didn't include in Froyo that we're working on currently are method inlining and trace extension. And by trace extension, I mean we're going to have those traces run more than a couple basic blocks, mostly so that we can identify loops. It's important to identify loops in the hot traces so that you can perform the loop optimizations. Other things we're looking at is uh, persistent profile information, offline trace coalescing. These are really um, things that address that case in which we want to do something when your phone is charging, when you're not actively using it uh, to make things go faster. And then finally, uh, tuning, tuning, and more tuning will continue to, uh, to make this thing better. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Ben, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about the things you can do if you go out and get the uh, sources of the JIT and build some of these special profile versions. Okay, thank you, Bill. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Chen. I'm also a software engineer in the Delvic team. Now that you know the overall structure and the performance figures in the version 1.0 of the Delvic implementation, in the second half of the talk, I'm going to go over the key techniques we used to address the performance and the correctness issues we encountered during the course of development. If you are also a compiler hacker and plan to make contribution to the Delvic project in the future, or even plan to pull the JIT to a brand new platform, I'm sure you'll find the following information very useful. If you are an app developer, please try to stay awake for the next five slides. And <laughs> after those, you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the speed up from the JIT. So after the JIT infrastructure is in place, the typical tuning, tuning, and more tuning cycle starts with workload analysis. Because if the majority of cycles are spent in a VM interpreter, and as a good benchmark for additional JIT tuning, because the maximum cycles that can be shaved by the JIT will only be a fraction of those originally spent in a VM interpreter. So a tool we can use is called OProfile. And with the profiling information, you get the rough idea on whether to expect a 5x or 0.5% speed up from the JIT. And once the workload is in, uh, the suitable workload is identified, the next task is to verify whether the JIT is able to migrate all the cycles from the VM interpreter to the JITed code cache. Again, a profiler will be able to provide you some insight to validate if that's the case or not. But all profile cannot provide, at least for now on the Android platform, is the capability to distinguish individual translation boundaries in a code cache. Therefore, it also lacks the capability to map a translation to the Java source level. So we wrote our own ad hoc profiler, which will instrument every translation with count increment instructions. And from the profile counts, you can find out the hottest translations very easily. And those are good starting points to find out additional performance tuning opportunities. Then in the third part of my talk, I'm going to share with you some practical ways to debug the JIT. Like all other compiler projects, if the compiler is crashing, 
a conventional way to triage that is to selectively disable more and more operations in the compiler until the smoking gun is found. Not only that's a tedious and a lengthy process to begin with, the dynamic nature of the JIT adds additional challenge to the triage process because the bad translation you're trying to identify may not be compiled every time. So we take a step further by converting the frequent synchronization with the interpreter to our advantage by designing a verification framework that actively validates every single line of GTIT code against the interpreter, which is considered a golden reference of the VM implementation. If there's any divergence detected there, we will report that in a, in a log, and that will greatly shorten the triage process. Now let's move on to workload analysis and benchmarking. I remember in my school days, benchmarking for the compiler is really boring. I run a, a single command to start the test harness for spec 95 or 2000, and a few hours later, I got a bunch of numbers come back. If I'm using a simulator, I actually can plan a day trip between two benchmarking runs. And on the an Android device, since the most likely CPU intensive workload are games, I definitely won't mind spending an extended period of time playing one of my favorite games, Robo Defense, to measure its performance. Well, it turns out that <clears throat> the CPU cycles spent on a VM is really, really light in this workload. So here is the old profile result taken from playing a game from level 00 to 080. And you can see that 74% of the CPU cycles are spent in a SCIA library, busy drawing the robots on the screen. The time spent in a VM is actually only 4.34%, including the GC time. So it turns out that this is a perfect benchmark for SCIA tuning or even GCC tuning because SCIA is native code. But the maximum performance gain you can get from optimizing a VM is capped at 4.34%. Now let's look, look at a, di a different game called Checkers from the brand puzzle section on the Android market. And this is actually written by a fellow Googler, Art Beak. And regardless of the JIT, this is a perfect benchmark because that will clearly print the number of nodes traversed in a fixed amount of time on the bottom right screen. And let me zoom in there. So in the two screenshots here, the left hand one is the eclair version or the interpreter only version. The right hand one is the JIT version or Froyo version. And the play time is set to 10 seconds. As Spiel mentioned earlier, we measured a 5.4x speed up on Nexus One as the score jumped from 965k to 5.2 million. One fun fact about the game is that if you look at the feedback on the Android market, you will find a few one or two star ratings because people think this game is too difficult for users to beat. So I'm pretty sure that the checkers players will be among the first wave of Froyo users to notice the additional performance difference, but probably through frustration. <laughs> and in case you are wondering why I chose a remote cousin of the 099 Go benchmark from Spec95, to showcase the JIT running on a 2010 Android device. Well, there are two primary reasons. The first one is the checkers is an easily accessible application on the Android market. And that can be used to measure the VM baseline performance across different platforms very easily. The second reason is tuning a JIT is like tuning a muscle car, where you want all the horsepower to stay in the powertrain instead of being wasted by air conditioner or stereo. So here is the 10 second profile result taken from the JIT version, where the uh, Delvic JIT co-cache line accounts for all the cycles spent in the co-cache. And libdvm.so accounts for all the cycles uh, spent in a statically compiled code. The combined sum here accounts for 96.45% of the overall CPU time. And that's why optimizing a VM will provide you the biggest bang for the buck for this kind of workload. On the other hand, if the game is modified in the future to perform a fixed amount of workload in the shortest amount of time, then you can spend 80% of the CPU cycles doing something else or simply sleep. Now let's take a look at the breakdown between the dynamic and the static cycles 
as shown here, the ratio is 97 to 3. It means that the trace-based JIT did an excellent job identifying all the hard traces in the workload and migrated cycles from the VM interpreter to the JIT co-cache land. Now let's move on to the second topic, which is how to measure the effectiveness of the JIT itself. So in, in addition to the top line performance numbers, the amount of resource consumed by the JIT is another important area we want to monitor. So if you load a pro, uh, for example, you want to know the code blow ratio from Delvic Bico to the generated native code, because the code cache is a fixed sized memory buffer. And the lower the code cache, uh, code blow ratio is, the more translations can be placed in there. And right now we don't have garbage collection on the code cache. So whenever that gets full, we just nuke it and restart from scratch. And that's why we also want to know how fast the JIT compiler can crank out translations. So if you load the profiling version of the VM onto the phone, at any time, you can just send a user2 signal, or 12, to the PID of a selected process, and a bunch of useful statistics will be printed in a log. For example, the numbers here are taken from the system server process after using a phone for 20 minutes, including checking emails, browsing a web, and making phone calls. In this particular snapshot here, there are 98, 98, or close to 10,000 compilations made during this 20 minute span. And they occupy 796 kilobytes in the code cache. So on average, each compilation takes about 80 bytes. And although we are not doing method-based compilation, we still try to keep track of the total size of hot methods. The way we, would, we do that is whenever a trace is picked up by the compiler thread, we also identify the containing method and tag the method as hot. In this way, we can get a total size of the hot traces and hot methods in a Delvic Bico level. So in this example here, the red number 104K accounts for the total size of these 10,000 hot traces. And the green number 396K is the total size of the hot methods. And as, as Bill mentioned earlier, the trace-based JIT effectively only touched 26% of the Delvic Bico in the hot methods. Now that we know the total size of generated code and the original Delvic Bico size in the traces, we can calculate the code blow ratio, which is 7.7 .7 in this case. It is actually not as high as that appears to be, because Delvic Bico is known for its compact representation. And all the new and range checks that couldn't be optimized away are generated inline by the compiler. But there's always room for improvement, and we'll definitely look into that. Now let's take a look at how fast the G compiler can produce compilations. The way we measure that is whenever a work order is consumed by the compiler thread, we take a timestamp. Then when a generated code is installed in a code cache, we take another timestamp. Then the delta here is the work clock turnaround time per compilation unit. So an example here, to generate these 10,000 compilations takes slightly over six seconds out of the 20 minute span. And on average, each compilation takes about 609 microseconds. Also note that the time measured here involves the boot process which is very busy because there are many, many threads containing for the single CPU in the system. So the JIT latency here can be considered as the upper bound. When a system is in a stable state, the JIT latency we measure is typically in a 100 to 150 microsecond range. Now let's talk about the last performance tuning trick in the talk, which is how to use the JIT, uh, JIT profiler to inspect the quality of generated code. Again, if you load the profiling version of the VM onto the phone and enable a special property like that specifying a title, you have effectively enabled a JIT profiler. And at any time, if you send a user2 signal to the PID of a selected process, all the sorted profile counts will be printed in a log. And the numbers here are also taken from the system server process. I'm going to use the top row to go over the meaning of individual cells. The first number, 15368, is the total number of times that the hottest translation is dispatched. And that accounts for 1.15% of the total dispatches. The 0 plus 2, 283 tuple means that the beginning offset of the translation 
is at the begin uh, is also at the beginning of the containing method, and there are two Delvic instructions, including a trace, and it's, it comes from line number 283 in hashmap.java. The verbose output of the top 10 translations, including a Delvic bytecode and a generated thumb or thumb to instructions, are also printed in a log, and that will facilitate in-depth code quality analysis. And I'm going to show you a verbose output momentarily. Now let's move on uh, to the third topic, which is uh, the d about the debugging and the verification tools we developed and how we strive to ensure the highest level of stability of the JIT. So when the, uh, right now let me turn on the phone, uh, this one. And I'll put that aside first. Okay. So if the VM is brought down by a JIT bug, it usually manifests itself either as native crash in a code cache or on caught exceptions in a Java source level. So the phone here I just turned on actually contain an injected bug in one of the code gen routines, and it will never make to the home screen. But if you look at the bug reports in a log, you will see a variety of reasons reported. For example, you will see a runtime exception thrown in a system server thread. And a, another symptom due to the same injected bug is a array index out of bound exception in a window manager thread. And yet another symptom due to the same bug is a stack overflow error in a system server thread. And in case you are wondering what the injected bug was, I basically made a one line change in the load constant routine so that all a 16 bit sign extended constant loaded by the JIT will be one greater than the original value specified in the bytecode. And this phone will be stuck in the miserable state forever. And if you look at the crash reports, it is not clear whether the injected bug, whether the bug is in the application itself or the JIT compiler. And uncertainty like that will definitely hinder the triage process. So in real life, when we get an incoming bug report concerning the JIT, the first thing we do is to disable the JIT and try to reproduce the problem in an interpreter-only mode. If the problem just goes away, then we know, okay, it must be our fault. And roughly speaking, the top two sources for issues in the JIT come from code generation routines and optimization routines. In the early days, when the JIT does only O0 type of code generation, since there are 256 bytecode in the system, there are only 256 potential places for a bug to hide. So the first debugging support we implemented is to selectively disable an arbitrary set of opcodes for the JIT, and we use the interpreter to execute those. So as long as you can find a reliable way to reproduce the crash, it's only a matter of several rounds of binary research to root cause the problem. And clearly, the injected cogen bug can be found that way. But as the compiler becomes more and more sophisticated, and additional optimizations like register allocation or scheduling are in place, the binary search mechanism becomes less reliable because disabling certain opcodes might just get rid of instruction mix that triggers the problem. So we also implemented a method-based filtering mechanism where as long as you can narrow down the bug to a small set of methods, you can enable or disable the JIT only for traces coming from those methods to see if that makes any difference. As you may already have noticed here, the triaging techniques we use here involves constant toggling between the JIT and an interpreter. And we are very motivated not to do that by ourselves manually. So the in ingenious idea we came up was to hire a summer intern last year. <laughs> and the name of the project is self verification But instead of locking an intern in his office doing verification all by himself, we actually worked together by designing a brand new verification framework based on tricks to roll back and commit the memory states. So basically, the VM is able to execute the same instruction sequence twice by two different execution engines in an interleaved way. At the end of both rounds, we do a state comparison and report divergence detected there. So we call that self-verification. And because the execution and the verification all happen on the same physical device, 
without user intervention. And it is capable of detecting both code generation and optimization bugs. So now let me turn on a second phone here, which is loaded with the same code generation bug, but with self verification enabled. My prediction is it will be able to tell you exactly where the injected bug is, and fixing that will take less than three minutes. But before that happens, let me quickly go over the workflow of self verification. So if you take a, a snapshot of the VM state, there are three categories of information that matter the content on the stack, the content on the heap, and the Delvic PC. So the verification cycle starts by creating a shadow copy of the top frame on the stack. And we only need to care about the top frame because currently the trace is confined in a single method boundary. Then all the heap accesses in the trace are intercepted and emulated at runtime. So all the store to the heap will be stored in the simple table data structure by the address and data pair. And all the loads from the heap will be routed to the table first to see if there's any recent update from the same trace. If not, the content will be served by the real heap. Then we dispatch the jitted code and let it execute to the end. Then we will remember the end PC. Then we restore the PC to the beginning value and re-execute the same instruction sequence using an interpreter. We'll know exactly when to do state comparison because right now there is a maximum number of instructions that can be included in a trace. So if we hit the limit before seeing the end PC, we know we have a control flow divergence, then we'll just report that. Otherwise, when the end PC is met, we just initiate a state comparison and report any divergence detected there. So in fact, we can configure the self verification in one of two modes, blocking versus non-blocking. If we just implemented a brand new optimization, we want to run that in the blocking mode because the VM will just freeze the application if there is a divergence detected, and that will get our immediate attention. But if the goal is to find corner case box, which may take longer to service, we want to run that in the non-blocking mode where the VM will let the application to continue as long as the debugging information is recorded in a log. In this way, you can do stress testing on your primary phone 24 by 7 without the worry that the phone is not functional when you, when you need to use that. And so the phone here, I, the second phone here is actually running the self verification in a non-blocking mode. And that's why the phone is still usable. And I'm going to use the extracted example here to go through the meaning of the debugging information. And I'm going to show you the live log after that. So first you will see it is a clear message telling you that some kind of divergence are detected in the registers. It will also tell you the class name, method name, and the Delvic PC of the offending translation. Then it will tell you the instruction sequence executed by the interpreter before the divergence is detected. In this case here, the interpreter ex executes a const16 instruction followed by an if greater or equal instruction. It will also tell you where the divergence comes from. And in this case here, it's in the v0 register in a Delvic stack frame. And the interpreter version is b5, and the jitted code is b6. And remember, the injected bug is in const16, where the jitted value is one greater than the interpreted value. Since we manage the code cache by not only storing the generated code, but also the original trace information, we can easily replay the compilation request with verbose mode turned on so that you can see the Delvi code and the corresponding native code. And that's exactly the same mechanism used by the profiler to report the content of the hard translations. So in this particular example here, you will see that the const16 uh, const is trying to load value 181 into v0. And since we know the divergence is in v0, we just follow the native code that touches the same location on the stack. Right now, the register allocator will reserve R5 as the frame-based pointer. And since v0 is the first slot on the stack, so we know it must be the store R0, R5 plus 0 that deposits the bad value onto the stack. Then we follow the usedef chain on R0 
then we see that, oh, this move here is trying to load 182 to R0. But the original bytecode is trying to load 181. And bingo, we have found a bug. So now let me quickly show you the live log spilled on the phone here. So if I just type ADB logcat, you can see a lot of live debugging information is spilled on the phone as we are using that. And hopefully through the example here, you see the strength of self-verification because that's easy to use. It provides really good test coverage. And you will isolate and report any problem found. And that's why we get to spend more time writing useful optimization code than debugging. OK, so to wrap up today's talk, over the past year, our team has delivered a resource-friendly JIT for the Delphic virtual machine from ground up. We pay special attention to the memory overhead so that it can fit the budget on embedded systems. And through a set of CPU-intensive workloads, we demonstrated that it, it can provide 2 to 5x speed up over the Eclair release. And we already have new optimizations waiting in the pipeline. And we believe that JIT will enable a new class of applic applications written for the Android platform. So in your new application, if you can provide an easy way to find out the performance numbers, like the checkers game, we'll be more than happy to use your application as a real-world benchmark to explore new optimization opportunities in the JIT. And last but not the least, we have a hardworking verification robot in the Delvic land. And that's why we encourage people to just sit back, relax, and enjoy the speed up from the JIT. Thank you. That's all we have. And now we have some time to take a few questions. And uh, probably best to go to the microphone so that uh, people can hear. Okay, there's one. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just curious before you, right, since you're verifying the, the JIT against your interpreter, um, are you 100% sure that you don't have bugs in the interpreter? Yeah. The, we're, we're, the interpreter has been pounded on quite well. And in fact, one of the th reasons why the interpreter is such a nice thing to compare against is that it's really, you can think of it as there's only 230 or so Dalvik bytecodes. And the interpreter deals with them individually. <laughs> So you can individually validate each of those 230. What makes the JIT more difficult to validate is that when we optimize, we're interleaving instructions. We're rearranging things. And so the combination effects um, makes it much tougher to validate. The interpreter is relatively simple to make sure it's correct. Okay, and, our, and our interpreter's been solid for quite a while. OK, second quick question. When you have a, a trace that, ha that contains a branch instruction, or when you start, you mentioned stitching the traces together, um, how do you know that the state of all variables, the stack, the heap, anything that trace can refer to is consistent between multiple runs of that trace? In other words, how do you know the, traces, the trace is actually valid if it includes a branch instruction? When you start running it, um, how do you know that you're actually going to follow the branch when you start running the, the trace ahead of the branch instruction? Yeah. So the trace will, will uh, kind of reevaluate um, all of its variables as it's running. The, um, the one, what you may be getting at is, Ben, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, predicted um, invokes? Yeah, so for <clears throat> Java virtual calls, we try to uh, chain the call side to the most likely call lead. But we do keep a live profiling count as the, the invocation is dispatched. If we found that it mis we mispredict too often, we will try to reach in that to the currently most likely colleague. So we do have some dynamic learning system in the JTIT code. OK, thank you. Hi. Um, so if I understood correctly, for each process you compile, right? So it's separate. So how about system libraries? Do I also compile uh, each time in each process? 
Or yes. It... So in, in this release, the answer is yes. We don't, we don't pay attention to where the execution comes from. And so if multiple processes are using the same system code, each will have its private hot traces. And those traces may be different from process to process. Uh, we have explored some future possibilities of having some kind of canned, um, pre-compiled, pre-optimized traces for common system stuff, uh, but we don't have that in first release. Okay. Another question. Um, it's not directly related to JIT, but how about garbage collection? Can you say anything? Did it got faster on Froyo or? Um, all we can say is we have colleagues currently working on that. Okay. But maybe that will be the next milestone release. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, I had two questions. The first one is, does it work on x86? And the second one was, are you generating thumb instructions and ARM instructions, or just uh, thumb, or what's going okay. on? Okay. So this release, yeah, this release of the JIT is uh, is for ARM processors, and we will generate. Uh, in general, we try to generate thumb instructions for the traces, but we'll occasionally branch out to common routines that are done in ARM. And we'll either generate thumb or thumb2, depending on the, uh, what's supported by the underlying processor. We also un will we'll understand whether the underlying processor has VFP floating point, and we'll either use those instructions or generate calls out to runtime support routines to handle floating point. It's, it's configurable when you build the JIT. So only only ARM right now? Is that oh, what you meant? That's that's correct. Only ARM processors today. Okay. And do you want to answer a question from okay. from the moderator? Oh, moderator questions. Um, power savings. So the power savings question is much like the um, general performance. We uh, well a, a little bit like that. Um, when we're doing less, you know, taking less CPU cycles to do the same amount of work will be saving the power that would have been consumed by those CPU cycles. I wouldn't expect you to notice a big power difference in normal usage because the primary consumer of power on the device is, is generally going to be the display and the radios. And then what's left over is the CPU and memory and we'll compress the CPU cycles somewhat. So we expect that to be positive. Um, but it, it was not the primary motivation for doing the JIT. Performance was the primary motivation. Yeah, let's see what. So the next one is how well does the JIT compiler use the native processor? Does it produce generic ARM v5 code, or is it smart enough to optimize ARM v9 with Neon extensions? I think we answered that one. Yeah, yeah. It, it's configurable. <clears throat> and we answered the GC question too. And next one is what kind of memory footprint is the JIT compiler aiming for? And how much will be left for the application after en en enabling JIT compilation? So we, we aim for 100K. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So our, our target was about 100K. On the, uh, the Nexus One has more memory, so we kind of relaxed uh, the, re the re constraints for that. But it's also a configurable thing, too. We can kind of cap the max usage of memory. But in general, we were shooting for about 100K bytes per process. Yeah, so I think we'll answer the last question here. So people's test indicate it will be up to 450% faster. But how noticeable is the change to the end user? So the answer is your mileage may vary. So suppose you have a workload where 50% of the cycles are in the graphics and 50% in the VM. And even though we provide 5x speed on the VM part, you're only going to notice 40% gain. So it really depends on the distribution of the work cycles to begin with. And I think we run out of time. Thank you. Hi. Oh, okay. All right, yes. One more. Bob has had uh, Giselle instruction set from quite some time, and Android for now is primarily targeted for ARM uh, you know, hardware. Uh, do you, can you uh, elaborate on um, Dal, uh, Dalvik's use of Giselle instruction set? And if not, is Google working with ARM for future optimizations on the chipset itself? Okay. Well, let me just make that really brief. The, um, we're not using the, the, actually, I think what you're, you're shooting for is the Thumb 2 EE extensions. Um, that kind of are then in ARM processors to support JIT compilation. Those are good things, but if you look at them more carefully, what they really do is they will boost an interpreter's speed when it's handling bytecodes one at a time. 
Okay, they, they make things go faster if you don't try to intermix instructions. The gain from the JIT happens because we're able to take a collection of instructions and interleave them with scheduling and optimization. And in that environment, the kind of uh, hardware execution of bytecode model actually holds you back a little bit. So we believe we're, we're faster with this model than we would have been if we'd actually used uh, hardware acceleration of individual bytecode execution. And I think we are, we are really out of time. Okay, thank you.